Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning to those of you in the West Coast. Welcome to our program today entitled The Roadmap to HIPAA Compliance, What Your Nonprofit Needs to Know. My name is Jeff Tenenbaum. I'm the chair of the nonprofit organization's practice here at the Venable Law Firm in Washington, D.C. Uh, thank you to those of you who joined us here for lunch in our uh, D.C. office, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining us on the telephone from across the country. We have a nice audience of, I think, around 175 on the phone from, uh, from around the country today, and uh, a modest group here in D.C., but we appreciate you coming out in the hot dog days of August. Uh, not the most fun time to be in Washington, but uh, hopefully this program will uh, make it very worthwhile for you. Uh, this is a really important topic, so important that we decided to break our record and have five speakers on the, uh, on the panel for you today. Um, it really is an important and very complicated subject. Uh, it's an area in which we provide a lot of guidance and counsel uh, to our firm's nonprofit clients, and uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, panelists uh, on the program today are really knowledgeable in this area, uh, obviously in, in, uh, in, in various different areas, which, which is why we have so many speakers today. Uh, despite that, I promise you we will get out of here by uh, 2 o'clock Eastern time, uh, and uh, we uh, certainly promise to pack a lot of information into that short time. Um, in terms of uh, uh, logistics, uh, those of you here in the room have a uh, copy of the uh, printed handout book that has the um, PowerPoint slides in there and related handout materials. Uh, those of you on the uh, webinar should have had the PowerPoint emailed to you. All of you will get an email tomorrow that will contain a link to the recording of today's program along with the streaming PowerPoint presentation and all of the handout materials. Fre feel free to share that with colleagues and others who, uh, who may be interested in uh, hearing more about the topic. As many of you know, because many, many of you are repeat attendees, this program is part of our monthly series that we do on nonprofit legal topics that we've been doing for about two and a half years now. And you can find the recordings of all of these programs on our website at venable.com slash nonprofit slash recordings. Uh, that link is also found on the last slide of today's PowerPoint presentation. Uh, in terms of uh, questions today, depending on how things are going, we may stop midway and take some questions. Uh, otherwise, we'll hold questions until the end. So please make a note of your questions as we go along. And if you certainly have, a, especially in the room, if you have a burning question, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Kelly in the back will be here with a handheld microphone to walk around so you can pose your questions to the speakers, uh, and everyone on the webinar will be able to hear you. Those of you on the webcast, uh, just uh, send your questions to me via the chat feature on the webinar software, and I'll pose those to our speakers at the appropriate times. Uh, preview of uh, some upcoming programs. Yes, it is August in D.C., and we decided to do not one but two programs in August. Not quite sure why we made that decision. Uh, my fault, certainly. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we do have a really interesting program coming up on August 21st entitled The IRS Final Report on Nonprofit Colleges and Universities, Lessons for All Tax-Exempt Organizations. Uh, this is a program that is uh, certainly very relevant to colleges and universities, but equally, uh, if not more relevant to uh, all other types of uh, nonprofit tax exempt organizations. It's a, a really interesting final report. There's really a lot of important lessons for all exempt organizations. Uh, we've spent quite a bit of time uh, analyzing the report, uh, writing a pretty comprehensive article on it, and we're going to do this program on the 21st. It should be very interesting. And then in September, uh, switching gears to a whole other area of law altogether. Our program is entitled on September 18th, entitled Keeping Up with Technology and the Law, What Your Nonprofit Should Know About Apps, the Cloud, Information Security, and Electronic Contracting. I uh, hope you'll join us for both of those two upcoming programs. Uh, our speakers today, uh, Tora Johnson, uh, Lisa Keenan, Kelly DeMarchis, uh, Jen Berman, and Molly Ferrioli. Ferrioli. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just having the pleasure of meeting Molly in person for the first time today. Uh, I'm not going to take time, unfortunately, to go through their bios, but you have uh, all of their bios in your handout materials. Um, and uh, for those of you in the room, they're in your, your program book here today. But needless to say, uh, all, all of our uh, speakers are very talented colleagues from both our uh, D.C. and Baltimore offices. You're going to learn a lot from them today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Tora Johnson, to get us started. Tora. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, you'll see our agenda. It is jam-packed, but as Jeff said, we will get you out of here on time. We'll start. I'll do the overview of HIPAA. Then Lisa Keenan will talk about the privacy rules. And then uh, Kelly will talk about the new notice of breach, Jen about the security rule, and then Molly uh, will follow up with business associate agreements, Notice of privacy practices, training, and then we'll open it up for questions. 
So let's start with the overview of HIPAA and how we got to where we are today with everybody in the room and on the phone. The real focal point behind HIPAA was to bring down the cost of health care, which may sound very familiar these days. And um, the idea was let's get all payers and providers using the same electronic transaction for the payment of health care services. Because up until that date, everybody was using their own formulas and, and language for paying and paying for health care. And so we had the first standard electronic transaction regulations that were to achieve this efficiency and savings, and they went into effect in October of 2003. But as that was happening, people were realizing, well, we have all of this sensitive information now flowing electronically, we better make sure that we keep it private and secure. So we had the privacy rule, which interestingly went into effect first. It went into effect in April of 2003 and then followed by the electronic transactions in October. And then a couple of years later, it was dovetailed with a security rule, which really focuses just on electronic PHI, electronic health information, which we'll unpack what exactly that is in a few minutes. Um, so the privacy rule focused on keeping medical information confidential and safeguarding it, electronic transactions on the, on the billing and payment, and the security rule really focused on the IT side of the electronic flow of medical information. And uh, there was a whole flurry of activity along these compliance dates of 2003 and 2005, and then things went a little bit dormant until we had HITECH, the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act of 2009. And actually, that was part of the stimulus bill, which is hard to remember. Um, I remember talking to my colleague to my right saying, I think there's something in there about HIPAA. We need to, we need to dig a little bit deeper into that reinvestment act. And, and lo and behold, there was a new push towards um, electronic health records and security behind them. And then um, as part of high tech, there was also a new requirement to notify individuals if their health information was breached. And we quickly got guidance as to what that meant and what we needed to do to comply in February of that year. And then we did not get for a very long time regulations under high tech as to what all the nuance of the statute meant until this past January. So why everybody in the healthcare field has been very busy keeping up to date with the Affordable Care Act and everything that requires as far as compliance, we got finally these final regulations under HIPAA. They came out in uh, January uh, 25th, and we are all aiming towards the compliance date of September 23rd for these new regulations. And that's really what's highlighted on, on this next slide. So. We're sitting here, it's hard to believe, in August, and the magic date for coming into compliance with these new regulations is the September 23rd, although there is a transition period for business associate agreements, which we'll talk about and Molly will really focus on, but they, in, in some cases you have up to an extra year to get those in place and updated for the new law. So what did the omnibus regulations that were issued in January do? They made modifications both to the privacy rule and the security rule, and they made business associates directly liable under HIPAA. Until this time, only covered entities, which we'll talk about in a minute as to who is actually directly subject to the law, up until the omnibus regulations and their effective date of September 23rd, only covered entities can be subject to penalties for failure to comply. As of September 23rd, Entities that help covered entities perform their services and touch health information will now be directly liable. So um, in a minute, I'm going to do a slight poll of people in the room to find out what category everybody fits into. But for business associates, the table is really changing, and um, there's a real drive for business associates to have everything in place that they need to for their, the privacy security rule as of September 23rd. They're also, uh, under these regulations, they're uh, strengthened restrictions on the use of people's health information for marketing and for the sale of, of their medical information and on fundraising. There's some uh, enhanced rights to individuals to see and access their protected health information. 
There are new standards on what requires notice to individuals if their medical information has been breached, and um, heightened enforcement, which we'll go on and talk, to, talk about in a little bit. And then there's some miscellaneous changes. One that I think is entertaining is that once you have been deceased for more than 50 years, your medical information is no longer protected by this law. And that really came about because people were having a hard time doing the research that they needed to do because HIPAA was standing as a roadblock. So the government has said now that once somebody has uh, been deceased for more than 50 years, you can use their medical information freely. So let's get to the vocabulary. Covered entities, these are the entities that have always been directly subject to the law. They are healthcare providers, but it's not every single healthcare provider. It's a healthcare provider who bills electronically for their healthcare services. Anyone who is receiving reimbursement from Medicare is going to be a covered healthcare provider because you have to enter into the transactions electronically with, medical, with Medicare. So that's the first big bucket. Then there are health plans, and health plans is a, is a, is a loaded word because it refers not only to the Blue Cross Blue Shields and Aetnas and Cygnus of the world, the health insurance carriers. It also includes health plans, dental plans, whether or not they are fully or self-insured, meaning that uh, if you have, again, it's the, it's the Aetnas in the world that are standing behind their fully insured product, and it's also employers who self-fund their medical plans. Some employers decide they did, that they're not going to get an insurance policy to stand behind the benefits. They themselves will actually pay the benefits under the plan. Those are self-insured plans. And in those situations, because those medical plans don't have employees, the employers actually have to step into the shoes of the plan and make sure their plan is in compliance uh, and, and take all these actions that we're going to talk about here today. There are also clearing houses, which are those entities that take the billing information, the payment information, from a non-standard electronic transaction format into the standard electronic format. They're directly subject to these rules, and so are Medicare prescription drug plan sponsors. Now, business associates, that's the next big category. Those are the entities that perform services on behalf of covered entities that have access to medical information to do their jobs for the covered entities. Again, until high tech was passed, business associates were not directly liable to these, for these rules. They entered into contractual relationships with covered entities whereby they said they'd comply with a majority of the privacy and security rules, but they were not directly liable. The government couldn't come after them. HITECH changed the game there and said, no, business associates, we need you to be directly liable. And uh, we didn't have regulations. As I said, we waited for a very long time for regulations. We now have them. Until they go into effect until on September 23rd, business associates are not subject to audit and penalty by the government, but they will be as of September 23rd. And not only are the direct business associates of covered entities subject to these rules, but business associates that then subcontract out a portion of their services to other entities and give those entities access to medical information are all now subject also directly to this regime and to the penalties uh, as well. So you have a lot more entities out there in the world that are now directly subject to the privacy and security rule. And I think for some, especially when you're down the food chain to the subcontractors, there's a high learning curve. So we just discussed who's actually subject to these rules. And now the question is, what is protected health information? And it is a very broad term. It is individually identifiable health information in the possession of a covered entity or a business associate. So individually identifiable health information, it's health information, including demographic information, that relates to past, present, or future physical or mental health condition of a person, the provision of health care, or the payment for the provision of health care, and does or may identify the individual in any format, whether oral, written, or electronic. So it is a very broad definition as to what is the medical information subject to this regime. Now what I will do though, I will digress for a minute and say, yeah, it has to be that type of medical information, which is a very broad definition, but it has to be in the hands of a covered entity or a business associate, which is fascinating because 
Uh, as I said earlier, employer health plans are subject to these rules. But the same information in the hands of an employer, but coming to the employer to verify somebody's sickness from work or dealing with a disability plan, not subject to these rules. It's the very same information, but in that case it's in the hands of a disability plan or the hands of an employer, not in the hands of a covered entity or business associate, so not subject to these rules. So um, big exceptions are records that employers hold outside of their role as in offering health coverage, not disability records, not life insurance records, although very sensitive information. And that really distinguishes our legal system from the privacy uh, rules of other countries because it's not the information itself, it's the medical information in the hands of a covered entity or their business associates. So what is a compliance package? If you are a covered entity or a business associate, what do you need to do to comply with these rules? Well, you need to have privacy and security policies and procedures, and that's not new. There are updates that need to be made based on the regulations that were issued in January, but you've always had to have um, privacy and security policies and procedures. Now, the digression there is for business associates, they, um, there wasn't a technical requirement. It would be hard to comply with the requirements they had under business associate agreements without some policies and procedures. Now with high tech and these final regulations, they definitely have to have them under the security rule and best practices would be to have them under the privacy rule as well. You also have to have privacy and security officers. Again, that's clearly the rule for covered entities and uh, business associates do have to have security officers or a security officer, ideally best practice they also should have a privacy officer. There are business associate agreements. Those are the agreements between covered entities and business associates whereby the business associate says, okay, covered entity, I will safeguard the protected health information you are sharing with me to perform services for you. And likewise, business associates as of September 23rd will have to have sub-business associate agreements in place with their subcontractors that receive protected health information to say that the subcontractor will also make sure to protect and secure the protected health information. So it's a real downflow. Training. You need to, if you are a covered entity or business associate, you need to train your staff that has access to medical information so they know the do's and don'ts of what, can, what they can do with protected health information. And covered entities need to have a notice of privacy uh, practices. And really what that is is the boiled down plain English version of the privacy and security policies and procedures. It's what plans and providers tell customers, patients, and participants what the plan provider will do and how they will use protected health information, the rights individuals have to see and access the protected health information the covered entity has on their behalf. So the next slide is a snapshot of the penalties that uh, can be levied if you fail to comply. Again, these can now be uh, directed to business associates as of September 23rd. And when you look at them, you might not think that they're all that much in the end. And there's this 1.5 million annual cap. Again, that's no small figure, but you might say, okay, not so bad. But that is the wrong impression to walk away with. First of all, you'll see that the violations, the penalties escalate based on a state of mind. And that very first state of mind is unknown causes. So let me just read you what that definition is. That's where the covered entity or business associate does not know and by exercising due diligence would not have known that the covered entity violated or the business associate violated HIPAA. So does not know and by exercising due diligence would not have known. That's a pretty low threshold for imposing liability. What's more is when you violate HIPAA, you are violating more than one standard under HIPAA. And these are per violation. So the way the law is written, 
it is all uh, interwoven, uh, and if you violate one standard, I guarantee you you're violating at least another three. So an example is if you impermissibly disclose somebody's medical information, that's an impermissible disclosure, but I'm, but I'm willing to bet that you probably have a security violation as well because how did that, how did that disclosure happen? And so the government could come in at least two prongs there. And the cap is just based on each of the violations. So it can quickly escalate. I should also say that under high tech, uh, state attorney generals have authority to bring uh, claims and investigations on behalf of their citizens. There's no private right of action. An individual can't say, okay, I'm going to sue you under HIPAA for having violated my privacy rights. But they can go to the government and say, could you please audit and investigate. And under high tech, although we don't have regulations yet, so it's not in effect, there's going to be a provision where there's some cost sharing that can, ha or not cost sharing, but um, if penalties are assessed, those penalties can be shared with the individuals whose rights or whose information was breached or improperly disclosed. There's also criminal liability that goes uh, with the sale of PHI, impermissible sales. The next slide gives you an idea of what the government has investigated and how they have levied penalties. These are resolution, of agree resolution agreements, and they're saved for when um, the government has really found egregious behavior. And usually there's a penalty and a statement where the government says, you know what, we're going to stay in your backyard for a few years and just make sure that you continue to bring yourself into compliance and that you comply. And I thought it might be helpful to give you a sense of two of the latest cases where resolution agreements have been issued. And they're all public record. You can go right on to the Office of Civil Rights in, uh, to see these resolution agreements. And it is the Office of Civil Rights that enforces HIPAA. So the first one was announced in June of this year against the Shasta Regional Medical Center. And they had been accused of fraudulently billing Medicare. And so uh, a couple of their top officials wanted to defend themselves and went to the newspaper and said, well, this is really our side of the story, and disclosed protected health information as part of their defense. And the government picked up the newspaper, read the article, and said, hmm, isn't that fascinating? I think that's probably an impermissible disclosure, and knocked on their door and investigated and said that it was just a willing, well, that's, that's just too strong a word, but it showed that from the top down they didn't have the appropriate respect for HIPAA. And they assessed a penalty which was um, 275000 which given the slide that we just saw, that, that that doesn't strike me as outrageous, but what they did say is, you know what, you need to sh update your policies and procedures on safeguarding PHI, you need to retrain your workforce, and we're going to stick around and make sure that all happens for the next few years. And then in July of this year, WellPoint was updating one of its online application databases and left over 600,000 individuals' records accessible to unauthorized individuals, and the government and, and you know what, what, what happened here is, and Kelly will tell us about this, but entities have to self-report when there's been a breach of unsecured protected health information. Now, breach and unsecured protected health information are, are, are further definitions that need to be discussed, and Kelly will do that. And I will tell you all of HIPAA, every, every, every word is loaded with meaning and has to be examined for its definition. But government said it was a breach of unprotected, well, WellPoint looked at it and said, okay, we have a breach here of, of unsecured PHI, and therefore they had to self-disclose to the government this breach. The government picked it up and said, okay, we're going to come in and investigate. They assessed a $1.7 million penalty, and they're under this agreement now to resolve it. And, and the thing is, when Jen will talk about this a little bit, but the security rule says that when you're updating IT uh, solutions and applications, you need to take into account the security aspect of it. That when you do an assessment as to how secure your electronic systems are, it's not a stagnant um, experience. You need to revisit it from time to time. So if you're changing your IT system 
WellPoint at this point should have looked and said, okay, is it secure enough? Do I have everything in place? And in this case, they clearly did not. But it's a neat trick of the government to say they have to sell, you have to self-disclose and then to come in and assess penalties. Now, they have said publicly that they don't go in and investigate every notice of breach, and I don't mean to deter people from complying and, and notifying uh, the government when there have been breaches, but it's just an interesting view. And then there are audit programs where the government will come in and audit. And this slide shows you that to date they've done 115 and they, uh, entity audits. And actually they have used KPMG to do the audits. And 61 providers, 47 health plans, health plans being insurance carriers, and again, self-insured medical plans that employers maintain for their employees, and seven clearinghouses. Business associates in the room, you might take a you know, sigh of relief that you're not listed here, but, but your time is definitely coming. And when the government reviewed their audit, they decided and determined that the four top violations were impermissible uses and disclosures, failure to safeguard, um, inappropriate access to people's medical records, and failure to comply with a minimum necessary standard. So Lisa will talk about this a little bit, but essentially whenever you use somebody's medical information outside the treatment setting, you can only use the most narrow limited amount that you, can, that you need for the purpose for which you're using the medical information. They want you only to, to use what you need to nothing more. And again, that doesn't apply in the treatment setting because I think everybody in the room and on the phone would agree, you want your doctors to see everything they need to treat you. But outside of that, it's the minimum necessary. So those are the top violations. And then if there is a complaint that is filed, and if a preliminary review shows a possible violation due to willful neglect, the government is, is required to investigate and audit. So preliminary review, possible violation due to willful neglect, the government will knock. And that is the overview with HIPAA, and I'm now going to turn it over. Unless uh, Tor, before we get started, just a couple questions from the, um, from the webinar audience. Uh, first question, uh, do the business uh, associates also need to have a security officer and a privacy officer? Yes, they need to have a security officer. That's clear. The, they don't have a technical requirement to have a privacy officer, but I would argue that it would be hard to enforce the privacy restrictions on use and disclosure unless you had a point person within the organization. So I would say a best practice is to have the privacy officer too. Okay, and then two people actually asked the same question. Uh, would you mind repeating the um, uh, a major problem areas from the top violations? Sure. So the top four violations were covered entities impermissibly using or disclosing protected health information, not having the appropriate safeguards in place, meaning that uh, Jen will talk about the safeguards one has to have in place for protecting electronic PHI, but do you have the right technical access controls or the physical controls? Do you require a badge when somebody's entering a room that stores protected health information if it's in physical format? Um, access, people not authorized to see medical information or seeing medical information and violating the minimum necessary, using disclosing more medical information than you need for the specific purpose for which the disclosure or use is being made. And, and with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa, who will give us an overview of the privacy rule. Thanks, Tora. Uh, yes, today I'm going to be talking to you about the privacy rule, which I really think of as the, the crux of HIPAA. Um, it sets the limits on the uses and disclosures of an individual's protected health information and also gives um, individuals certain rights over their information. Protected health information, or as a lot of people refer to it as PHI, can be used and disclosed for treatment and payment and for healthcare operations. And by healthcare operations, they mean training, things like training, credentialing, um, enrollment in healthcare plans, um, renewal of health plans. PHI can also be used and disclosed for any purpose pursuant to a valid authorization. And in order for an authorization by an individual to be valid, it needs to be signed, dated, it needs an expiration date. Um, you have to have a, a detailed description of what is going to be disclosed and to whom it's going to be disclosed, and also a notice 
that um, it's possible for that information to be disclosed by the recipient. Make sure I'm on the right slide. Um, PHI can also be disclosed, used or disclosed for certain other purposes consistent with policy objectives, for instance, public health activities or law enforcement. And as Tora mentioned earlier, it's generally subject to the minimum necessary standard, the exception being um, any kind of treatment. Am I back then? Okay. The privacy rule also sets forth restrictions on marketing. So anytime a covered entity or business associate is paid to market products or services, an authorization is required, and the authorization would have to state that you are being paid um, to provide that to market to this person and use their PHI in so doing. Um, there are some exceptions for this. A promotional gift of nominal value provided by a covered entity is an exception, and a good example of that is anyone who's had a baby knows when you're in the hospital, they're giving you all kinds of samples of formula and diapers and things like that. A face-to-face -face communication made by a covered entity to an individual. So for example, if a physician in an in-office visit provides a brochure on medication that's being prescribed. Refill reminders um, by pharmacies, provided that the payment does not exceed the cost of making the communication to the individual. So pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers can provide payment to pharmacies, provide refill reminders but it's just going to be the cost of um, drafting and printing and mailing the reminder. And the Specialty Pharmacy Association has taken issue with this. They think it should be changed to, um, rather than re reimbursement for the actual cost of making the communication, it should be fair market value. Um, they say that's usually the standard for ensuring that there's no kickback involved. And CVS actually announced in May that they would no longer be making refill reminders because of this change. Um, also, communications that relate to the promotion of health in general um, that are not considered marketing as long as you're not uh, promoting a particular vendor. So a uh, health plan could send a reminder to um, one of its enrollees to it's time for their annual mammogram, for instance. The privacy rule also sets forth restrictions on the sale of PHI. And it's def defined now for the first time in the final rule. Um, it includes remuneration received directly or indirectly from an entity to whom PHI is disclosed. And it's not limited to financial rem remuneration. Um, it also applies to in-kind benefits. Any time that you're going to sell someone's PHI if you're a covered entity, you're going to need an authorization. It's kind of hard to imagine um, an individual signing such an authorization, but that's what the regs provide. And you can't um, condition the treatment, payment, or enrollment on the individual granting the authorization. An exception for this is research, which is a good thing. We, we, we want to encourage research, um, or, and, um, but only if the fee is otherwise expressly permitted by law. So for instance, the copying fee for medical records is permitted. That wouldn't be considered a sale of PHI. The privacy rule also makes several changes governing the use of PHI for fundraising. And fundraising is considered part of a covered entity's healthcare operations, so it is permitted. And the final rule expands the information that can be used for fundraising. So you could always use demogra demographic patient information, such as um, name, age, date of birth, and the dates of service. Now you can also use the treating physician information, uh, the Department of of service information and the outcome information, which is helpful for filtering. You can imagine that, for instance, a hospital might not want to um, send a fundraising communication to someone who's had a bad outcome. You must disclose the opportunity to opt out of fundraising in your notice of privacy practices. Molly's going to speak to um, this a little bit more, but you do have to have an opt out provision and it has to be clear and conspicuous. It cannot impose an undue burden on the individual. They consider um, requiring them to mail a letter to opt out too burdensome, so you can't do that. Um, permitted opt out mechanisms are providing a toll free number. Uh, providing an email address, 
or providing a pre-printed um, postage paid um, postcard. Again, a covered entity may not condition treatment or payment on the individual's decision to opt out. You have to have a system to track and apply opt outs and you must honor the opt out. Um, you cannot send any more fundraising communications if a person has, op has opted out. However, there is some flexibility um, with respect to the scope of the opt out. You could uh, provide that they opt out of receiving all f future communications re regarding fundraising or apply it just to that particular fundraising event. And you can also have flexibility as to how they opt back in. For instance, you could uh, just send a routine newsletter, newsletter to all patients and include a number for them to call to be placed back on the fundraising list. I also wanted to just remind you that the requirements only apply to the extent that protected health information is used in the fundraising. For instance, you don't have to um, abide by all of these requirements if you're just using a public directory in order to send a mailing to um, a certain geographic service location. An individual also has the right to request restrictions on disclosures of their PHI and to request alternative means by which they receive communications related to their PHI. So this comes up when perhaps someone doesn't want someone in their family to see a mailing that's coming in um, or bill for services that they received. And in general, covered entities don't have to comply. Um, we'll get to an exception to that, but if they do agree to comply with it, then they must abide by that restriction. So there's a new exception, um, and that is in cases where the disclosure would be made to a health plan for purposes of payment or operations, and the individual has paid out of pocket for the services. In that case, you would be required to restrict the disclosure. So Lisa, when would you see that happen? I think like I said a few minutes ago, um, it, it's usually with, it's something that might be embarrassing, a cosmetic procedure perhaps that they don't want a family member to know about. Uh, it's going to be something usually that someone's trying to keep quiet. You have to have a system in place that accommodates these requests, and that doesn't mean that you need a separate medical record, but you're going to have to have a system that flags the records that are not supposed to be disclosed. Um, you're not required to inform downstream entities. So for instance, a physician uh, honoring this request would not have to notify the pharmacy. But uh, the commentary to the final rule says that covered entities are encouraged to uh, counsel the individual that they should also inform the downstream entity as well. So there's some potential problem areas that you can imagine. For instance, what if the check bounces and you didn't get payment? In that case, you are not required to actually put them into collection before you bill the health plan, but uh, again, the commentary says that you should, the commentary to the final rule says that you should counsel the patient and you should try to make reasonable efforts to obtain payment before you contact the health plan. Can the provider collect the full balance before pro providing the services? Yes, you can require them to pay you up front. What does the patient have to tell the provider? Um, Actually, the more important question might be when does the patient have to tell the provider because you can imagine circumstances where you've already started treatment and then they make a request to restrict the disclosure and perhaps there's a hospitalization involved and it's kind of too late because the health plan's already been notified. It does apply to Medicare. Um, there's an ex exception um, in that if you have to make a disclosure pursuant to a Medicare audit, you can make the disclosure. The patient can pick and choose what is restricted, um, but this could be a problem with respect to future follow-up care, and um, individuals should be counseled that um, a disclosure might have to be made if, if they're seeking follow-up care and the health plan is going to pay for it. And then as far as bundled services go, um, you know, some uh, procedures have to be bundled for payment purposes, and if you're unable to unbundle the service, Again, counsel the individual that they 
um, you're going to have to notify the health plan of what was done, or they could have the option of paying for the entire bundled service. So Lisa, just to break in again, those little special situations that you just walked through, those aren't actually in the regulations. You made reference to the preamble, and I just think it's a good point to break in here and say that when you look at the privacy rules, you know, they're probably about this thick, but they have what's called a preamble that goes with them, which is probably about that thick, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but the preamble is twice as long as the regulations, and the preamble is where the government has responded to questions and comments raised by the general public to the proposed regulations. And in there is just a treasure trove and a wealth of information that puts the color on the privacy rules. So I always caution folks out there who are looking at the regulations and the regulations alone that that's only part of the picture. And all of this detail that Lisa is going through is really not there. It's in this preamble, and it really is an uh, insight into what the government is thinking. So this is a very narrow exception that deals with providers who are seeking payment from health plans or interacting with health plans for general operations. and. Uh, and it seems very straightforward, but when you dig a little deeper, there are all of these questions about what happens when it's a bundled service, et cetera, and you need to look deeper into the preamble that accompanies the regulations to, to really fully understand it. That, that's a really good point, Tora. Thanks for breaking in there. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of, we've all done a lot of reading and relying on that preamble section to provide some further explanation. Final rule also makes significant changes to an individual's right to review their um, PHI and to make copies of their PHI. Um, they refer to it as PHI that's in a designated record set. So for health plans, this would be enrollment, payment, and claims information. For providers, this is information that's in the medical record. And if the patient, the, uh, there's a new, under the new rule, if a patient asks for his or her PHI in a particular electronic format, you have to try to comply with that request. And if it's not possible, um, you can provide it in another electronically readable format. Um, if the individual still won't agree to that and you can't come up with some sort of agreement on what this format would be, you can provide a hard copy. But you need to try to make, um, try to provide it in the format that they've requested. And the time to respond to that request has been shortened from 60 days to 30 days with um, a one-time extension of another 30-day period. You also have to provide uh, copies. Uh, if they request copies be sent to a third party, you have to honor that request. HIPAA limits the charge that you can, um, the amount that you can charge to the individual to the cost of compliance, but state laws also have limits on that. So um, it's going to be either the lower of the state fee or the actual cost of compliance is what you would be able to charge them. And individuals can also request that their PHI be amended. Um, you have to respond to that request in 60 days. Uh, you don't have to comply with it if you don't agree, and the regs go into a lot of detail about what you have to do if you don't want to amend it. Um, but you do have to respond within 60 days and with an additional 30 days if needed, if you provide them a reason for why you need the additional time. And finally, under the privacy rule, an individual also has a right to an accounting of the disclosures that have been made to the, of their PHI. And currently, they have the right to go back six years, but there's an exception for the um, disclosures that were made relating to treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. That um, also applies equally to paper and electronic records. Under the high-tech rule, it's going to go to three years for electronic health records without um, any exception for payment, treatment, or healthcare operations, although there is a delayed effective date on this, and we're waiting for additional guidance to come out. Um, but we are expected to see something soon on that. So that's it for the privacy rule. I'm going to turn it over now to Kelly, who's going to talk to you about notice of breach requirements. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks. Um, as many of you who touch on PHI know, and as Tora noted in her HIPAA timeline at the beginning of the presentation, We've been operating under an interim breach notification standard now for a few years. Um, 
I'll be distinguishing between that interim standard and the final standard throughout this section of the presentation um, because the final rule has now finalize the standard once and for all. Um, if you're really familiar with the previous interim standards, a number of the elements have stayed the same, but there are a few changes built into the rule, and um, these changes are certainly major ones. Um, just as a jurisdictional note, both HHS and the FTC released similar rules. Um, they call them harmonized. And entities, depending on which agency regulates you, um, you would fall under one or the other. If you're what's called a dual role entity, you'd be subject to either role depending on the role that you were serving in at the time of the breach. Um, and just as an aside, we also want to remind you that a handful of states do include health information in their state data breach notification laws. And um, the trend that we're seeing is for more states to add health information. Um, most recently, Texas did so uh, last year to that definition of um, personally identifiable information in state data breach notification law. Okay, so um, breach is limited to unsecured PHI, and this preserves the safe harbor that was generally available under both state data breach notification laws as well as under the interim rule. Um, and the safe harbor holds that the acquisition of encrypted electronic PHI is not considered a breach. Um, it also takes destruction to account, which would cover PHI in uh, paper form. And there have been a number of investigations that have arisen out of paper records, um, things like prescription records being dumped in a dumpster where they were um, reasonably available to anybody who wanted to dig through the dumpster. Okay, who has to be notified? Uh, the rule imposes distinct obligations on both business associates and on covered entities. Uh, business associates are required to notify their covered entity, and they also have to provide certain information about the breach um, with, as part of this notification. Most importantly, the identity of individuals affected if that information is available. And the commentary to the rule makes clear that trying to identify the individual shouldn't hold up the notification. Uh, you should definitely get that ball rolling as soon as you're aware that there's a potential incident. Um, while simultaneously working towards identifying the individuals. Um, the covered entities' obligations, they're required to actually make notice to the individuals, uh, and they also have to notify the HHS secretary, who, as Tora mentioned, will publish these results on an online portal that's available through hhs.gov. Uh, they only publish breaches affecting 500 or more individuals. This portal has been up and running um, since the interim rule went into effect in 2010 and really is an interesting source of information on the types of incidents that are occurring. Okay, what is a breach? Let's get to the heart of the matter, which is how the rule defines breach. And this is where the most important change from the interim, interim rule uh, can be found. Under the interim rule, there was a presumption that an incident was not a breach unless there was a risk of harm to the individual, and this was called the risk of harm standard. This is known as sort of a subjective test that defined a breach to have occurred only when the acquisition, access, use, or disclosure of PHI carried with it um, a risk of harm to the person affected. Now, under the final rule, the new definition is an objective test, and it flips the presumption. The presumption is now that an incident is a breach and requires then notification to the individuals and to HHS unless you can prove otherwise. Um, specifically, the new rule presumes that a breach has occurred from any acquisition, access, use, or disclosure of PHI unless a risk assessment of the incident demonstrates a low probability that the data has been compromised. And this risk assessment has to be based on four separate factors. Uh, the first is the nature and the extent of the PHI that's involved. Um, some suggestions in the commentary say to look at whether financial information or social security numbers were involved um, because those are data elements that are viewed to have a higher risk of identity theft or fraud. Um, the flip side of that would be the disclosure of clinical information that doesn't contain any direct identifiers, which would be a lower risk type of PHI. Um, an example there would be a list of patient discharge dates considered relatively um, a low risk of compromise. 
Um, the second factor looks at the unauthorized persons involved. For example, the person who may have acquired or accessed the data, do they have an independent duty to protect the privacy or security of the information? Um, maybe the information was disclosed to, the example they give is a federal agency who has certain statutory requirements to, um, independent statutory requirements to protect uh, confidential information they might receive. The third factor looks at whether the PHI was actually acquired or viewed. Um, if a laptop is stolen and you manage to get the laptop back, can you do some forensics on it to determine whether or not the files held on the laptop that contained the PHI were actually opened? If they weren't, um, that's considered a lower probability. Uh, misdirected mail, when it was returned to sender, was the mail opened first or did it come back sealed? Those are the kind of factors you'd look at there. And then finally, the fourth factor would be looking at the extent of risk mitigation. Um, they say if you know to whom the information was disclosed, can you get them to sign a confidentiality agreement saying that they, they won't use it or disclose it further? Uh, can you get them to sign something saying committing to destroy it? Um, elements like that. The rule also contains information, uh, just as importantly, on what is not a breach. Um, Incidents that are not a breach include the unintentional acquisition, access, or use by a workforce member in good faith and within the scope of the authority with no further use of disclosure. Um, so if uh, a hospital employee opens the records of John Brown Smith when they were actually looking for John Blacksmith, this really isn't considered a breach provided it's in good, good faith. Um, and I'll note that the, the interim rule used the word employee, but they've now changed that to workforce member, uh, a broader term that would include interns, trainees, volunteers, candy stripers, folks like that. Also not a breach would be the inadvertent disclosure to a colleague who's also authorized to access PHI with no further use of disclosure, this is sending the wrong medical records um, to a fellow physician for care. And um, the third situation, disclosure where there's a good faith belief that the unauthorized person was not reasonably able to retain the information. And the examples given in the comments include a nurse handing discharge papers belonging to one patient to the wrong patient, patient realizing the error and then snatching them back, or mailing an explanation of benefits to the wrong address and they're returned unopened. In these cases, it might be reasonable to assume that even if someone actually laid their eyes on the information, that that person wasn't able to retain it in any meaningful fashion. Okay, so we've determined that a breach occurred. Who has to be notified? Notice must be sent to the individuals or the representatives, um, the individuals whose information is believed to have been accessed, acquired, used, or disclosed without authorization. Um, the notice should be in plain language, and it has to contain certain required elements, uh, including a brief description of what happened, including the date of the breach and the date of discovery, description of the types of PHI involved, uh, any steps individuals should take to protect themselves from potential harm, a brief description of what the covered entity uh, is doing to investigate the breach, to mitigate harm and protect against future breaches, and um, contact information for folks to direct questions to, including a toll-free number, an email, and a website or postal address. Um, this next slide is tied to the methods of notice, and they're pretty straightforward. Um, mail, email, consistent with any prior agreement to receive elect information electronically. Um, and then there is a provision for substitute notice, which would apply to any breach that involves 10 or more individuals um, if you have no contact information or out-of-date contact information. And in that case, you'd have to rely on substitute notice, um, which would be publishing notice prominently through the media, a newspaper, a website, um, and, and providing telephone toll-free number. Okay, next up, the timing of notification. Notification must be made without unreasonable delay in any event no later than 60 days after the discovery of the breach, even if the investigation is still ongoing. So um, you could easily see a situation that resolves in several waves of notification. At that 60-day point, you have a, a population that you know, notice goes out to them, and as the investigation continues, you realize it was more widespread than first believed, so a second wave would go out. Uh, either way, you have to 
sort of trigger the start of that notification process within the 60-day clock. Um, 60 days also applies to business associates, and um, we show here how that time frame is applied to a business associate depending on the kind of relationship that they have to the covered entity. And the rule does take law enforcement delay into account. So if um, part of your law, uh, law enforcement who's investigating the incident does require you to delay notification, you may do so without running afoul of that 60-day timeline. Okay, so we've been talking about um, 60 days from discovery. So what is that discovery trigger for the breach? Um, discovery would be the earlier of the first day on which the breach is known or should have been known through the exercise of reasonable diligence. So um, if your, your IT staff isn't patrolling your system or examining your firewalls as they should be, this certainly doesn't excuse you from not discovering the breach. Uh, also, the rule makes clear that organizations should have in place systems for detecting a breach as well as training and policies to ensure that discovered breaches or incidents are reported to management. Um, and, and just to echo what you were saying about the 60 days, this is a uh, really important point that comes up in negotiations between covered entities and business associates because if the business associate is your agent, then the covered entity's 60-day clock begins when the business associate knew or should have known of the breach. So you will often will see that the time period business associates have to tell covered entities is try, they, they try to compress that down to so something like a five days, ten days, so that the covered entity has as much of those 60 days as they can to get the notice out to individuals. And so a real question, all business associate agreements are basically drafted to say that they're independent contractors, that there isn't an agency relationship, but just because you say that doesn't make it so, and if it were ever looked at by the government, they would look at all the bells and whistles, facts and circumstances to see if you have an agency relationship. And likely you do if the covered entity has control over how the business associate does their day-to-day -day job and um, who does it and all those bells and whistles. So I'm sure for those uh, on the phone and in the room that negotiate these have seen that point come up. All right, I'm going to change gears for a few minutes now and talk a little bit about the security rule. And when we're talking about the HIPAA security rule, we're really only talking about electronic PHI. So that's protected health information transmitted or maintained in electronic format. And it includes really anything that you can think of that touches a technological system. So hard drives, disks, CDs, Internet. Um, there is, and, and we used to talk a lot about an exclusion for paper faxes, but even faxes now are often digitized. I know at Venable, when somebody sends us an incoming fax, it gets converted to a PDF and emailed to us. So anything that you can think of where the information is stored electronically is covered by the security rule. Important to note that doesn't mean there's no protection for paper. There are requirements that there be administrative, physical, and technical safeguards for paper too. Um, they're similar, they're in the privacy rule. So as we move on to what the security rule says, um, the security rule itself is designed to set out a group of standards around which organizations, and here we're talking about covered entities and business associates, there's no differentiation in the rules anymore um, for these purposes, are supposed to build security systems. And the rules themselves are designed to be technology neutral so that they set out sort of a set of protocols through which an organization needs to look at, and then it's flexible and scalable to the organization. So in figuring out how to secure that information, organizations are supposed to look to the size and complexity of their organization, what their capabilities are, um, their technical infrastructure, cost are all things that can be taken into account, but the real key is the probability and the criticality of potential risks to electronic health information. So it's really taking a hard look and figuring out how to protect this information and then doing it. So how do we get there? Well, there are 18 standards, and these break out into administrative, physical, and technical safeguards. I'll talk about each of those sort of three big buckets. And then there are, there are what they call implementation specifications. These are specific items that organizations need to look at in building their security systems. 
And I'll pause here for a second to say that some are mandatory, and that means you have to do them. And others are, are termed addressable. And this is one of those HIPAA vocabulary issues that comes up a great deal. Addressable does not mean optional in any way. Basically, when we're talking about an addressable implementation specification, we mean that the organization has to do it if it's reasonable and appropriate. If it's not reasonable and appropriate, you have to document why it wasn't reasonable and appropriate. So it's not a get out of jail free card. And really, as you're going through the process of implementing the security rule, you have to look at all 36 of these implementation specifications. So the first set are the administrative safeguards. And that actually takes up over half of the space of the security rule. And it's where you get things like policies and procedures and personnel designations that we've mentioned already. It's also where the real, the keystone to the HIPAA, to the HIPAA security process is housed, and that's the risk analysis and development of a risk management plan. The risk analysis is where an organization sits down and goes through all 36 of these implementation specifications to see what they have and how they're going to address those things. And it's not meant to just be done once. It's meant to be an ongoing dynamic process as technology changes. Organizations are expected to continually look at what they're doing, where they're housing their protected health information, and how to make sure that that remains safe. Um, this is very hard for us as lawyers because it's, it's one area where we can't do it on our own. There's not a compliance burden that you can say, this is what we have to do and we can check these boxes. It takes a team, and it involves sort of the IT people coming to the table, the business folks coming to the table, and the compliance people really sitting down together and taking a good hard look at what information is out there and how we're using it. From there, the risk management plan is developed. And all of the other issues that we'll talk about today are things that, that are looked at in the risk analysis and then incorporated into that management plan. So some of those issues include um, employment-related policies, sanctions for when folks don't follow the policies, um, information system reviews um, where you log and, and take a look at who's accessing your reports, when they're accessing it. Um, supervision and authorization for those folks and having a real checks and balances system in place to make sure that your workforce is using things appropriately. So that's really the administrative rules. Then we turn to the physical safeguards. And um, the first one here is workstation use and security. And, and it's one of my favorites because the concept of workstation has changed so much over the past 10, 15 years since many of these rules were originally contemplated. Um, because a workstation no longer just means a desk in an office building somewhere. So while yes, these rules do cover my badge that I use to get into Venable in the morning, they also cover my laptop at home and the Blackberry that I'm carrying, and really making sure that anywhere that people have access to this information is secure. Um, there's actually been additional guidance put out by HHS on what to do about off-site uses of protected health information um, that are really sort of startling to me in light of where things are in general right now. Um, so in that, in that guidance, um, HHS goes out of its way to say you should really only have off-site uses of this when it's really necessary for a business purpose. And, and what does that mean? Um, the examples are things like a home health nurse who needs to use a PDA or a laptop during a home health visit, or a health plan employee transporting the backup tapes to the secure off-site facility. Um, it's much more limited than um, what I would like it to be or what many of us would like it to be, which include like while I'm on the train down from Baltimore, I'd like to be looking at this stuff. And the truth is, is that really isn't permitted under these rules. The third big set is the technical safeguards. And here's where we get into things like encryption and um, password, patrol, password controls, firewalls, all the sorts of um, really technology-driven things that can be done to secure that device once you're, once you're on that device, once you've physically gotten to it. Um, so I mentioned the, the risk assessment earlier, and this is really what we would recommend that organizations be thinking of first, because all of those other details and the implementation specifications are very much sort of laid out for you when you're doing the risk assessment process. And that process is about following the data. Where do you have protected health information? 
Um, who sees it? When do they see it? How is it protected? And so what I think is sort of useful um, is to go back to that laptop PDA example for a moment and, and think about how you might look at, at those um, portable devices and making sure that those are secure. And I, I pick on this one not only because of the changes in technology, but also because when you look at those real-world examples that, that Tora cited that are publicly available, um, the vast majority of them have to do with portable media. So it's stolen laptops and hacked servers, um, well hacked servers I guess, but um, the, the storage tapes that people carry around, um, unencrypted Blackberries, things like that come up over and over again as being a problem. So what do you do? How do you look at um, that portable device question? And, and here, um, the first step would be to identify which devices your organization has and to track them, um, create an inventory of what's there. Um, and then maintain that inventory. You should know where any portable devices that hold electronic protected health information are at any time. Um, they should be locked down after they, haven't, after they haven't been used for a certain period of time. Their access should be denied. And then to get to that access, that, that turns on passwords and, and making sure that the right people are getting it. So you have um, situations where you have um, you, somebody who needs to have that portable device that we all carry, like the key thing, and a separate password. Um, encryption. Uh, Kelly talked a lot about uh, um, unsecured PHI and breach notification requirements. If your devices are encrypted, if the information is encrypted, it cannot be breached um, so to trigger that. You could have a problem. You could have a security incident. Things can happen, but breach so as to trigger that breach notification requirement cannot happen while information is encrypted. Um, and then updating these things, moving forward, always knowing and looking at what's going on with your technology. Uh, so I think that the real message on the security rule is this is very, very important for compliance folks to go back and really talk with your team, look at the IT, the business, the business needs, and figure out how you're going to keep that information safe. Uh, it is absolutely an area of increased scrutiny and probably one of the biggest risk areas where inadvertence and not sort of paying attention triggers those risks. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Molly, who's going to talk a little bit more about business associates. Thanks, Jen. So we've talked about business associates a lot during this presentation, but um, my goal in the next couple of minutes is just to tie everything together on, on those points. So as we've discussed, business associates are generally thought of as people who do certain things for covered entities that involve the use of disclosure of PHI. And what the new rules basically did um, was threefold. It expanded the definition of who is a business associate. Oh, thanks, Dan. Um, it expanded the responsibilities of business associates, and it increased um, the liabilities of business associates. So I'm going to focus on the those last two first, responsibilities and liabilities. So the first thing is that business associates have to do everything under the security rule that Jen just talked about, um, just as if they were a covered entity. So they have to do that whole risk analysis of security officers, policies and procedures, everything. And they also have to comply with the use and disclosure requirements of the privacy rule. So they don't have to do everything under the privacy rule, as Tora said, but they effectively have to do most of it. One exception that we'll talk about next is notice the privacy practices. Cover Business associates don't have to have their own. So for entities that were business associates prior to the changes, this is really not that new. They had to do all of these things under the business associate agreements. The change is that they're now directly liable for doing these things, which means that the government can come after them after September 23rd with significant penalties. So it raised the stakes of compliance. So the other thing that the new rules did was change the definition of who is a business associate. So this is our third bullet on, on this slide. So under the new rules, business associates now include health information organizations that oversee the exchange of health-related information among organizations, e-prescribing gateways, and other persons that provide data transmission services with respect to PHI to a covered entity and that require access to the PHI on a routine basis. So with this change, what HSS really did was confirm that anyone who provides data transmission or data storage services, and this is both paper and electronic, that involve PHI as a business associate, 
in the preamble, it talks about there are certain exceptions for um, entities like UPS or Postal Service or Internet Service Providers because they really, their access to the PHI is transient. Additionally, vendors of personal health records um, can be business associates. And perhaps the largest new category we've talked about is subcontractors of business associates. And a subcontractor, as we've said, is anyone who the direct business associate under the covered entity has delegated a service to that involves PHI. They are now business associates themselves. And anyone under them who they delegate to is a business associate. Uh, an example of this would be, for example, if there's a direct business associate of a covered entity and they um, hire a document destruction company to destroy their medical records that they get from the covered entity, that document destruction company would be a business associate itself. So a quick um, wrap up on timing. As we know, the final regulations were effective this past March. They go into uh, everyone has to comply with them by September 23rd of this year. Tora mentioned at the beginning there's a limited exception for certain business associate agreements. And we're going to talk about what is a business associate agreement next. But if parties had an existing business associate agreement prior to when those new rules were issued this past January, and the agreement was not renewed prior to March when the rules became effective, then you actually have a whole year past the compliance date, so not until September 22nd. 2014 to update those existing business associate agreements. Okay, so on business associate agreements, um, we've said before these are the agreements that kind of spell out what a business associate has to do regarding um, protecting PHI. It's crucial for covered entities and now business associates to, if they haven't done so already, identify what business associate agreements are in place currently. And then are there any other entities out there that we contract with that, um, on a basis that involves PHI that we don't have an agreement with? For covered entities, they need to look down towards their business associates and you know, see if there's anyone else out there. For business associates, they have an obligation to have these agreements in place, so they need to look up to their covered entities uh, and then down to their subcontractors. And subcontractors kind of need to do the same up and down look. And then um, you need to review the terms of your business associate agreements if you haven't done so already to make sure they've been updated in light of changes that were made to the new rules. And there were, rule, there were changes to the rules specifically in the regulations regarding business associate agreements. For example, changes need to be made regarding business associates' direct obligations to comply with the security rule um, and addressing the new requirements about subcontractors. But the agreements also need to be review, reviewed on a broader level to make sure that they reflect all the various changes to the HIPAA rules, for example, covering the new breach notification standard that Kelly talked about. Additionally, changes need to be considered in light of changes that the government made on agency and downstream liability. I think we've addressed this before, but covered entities now can be held liable for the acts of their business associates who, do, who are agents and who do something in violation of HIPAA and within the scope of their agency. And business associates likewise can be on the hook if their subcontractors violate HIPAA and they're, and they're acting within the scope of their agency. And Torres talked about this agency relationship is very highly specific. But as a result of that, a lot of business associate agreements try to avoid agency to the extent possible. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. But it really matters in terms of some of the negotiations including on what the, as Tor mentioned before, what the obligation is when there's a breach, how much time do you have to report between entities, and also um, on whether indemnification is appropriate. So we'll quickly talk about notice of privacy practices. This is something that covered entities are obligated to do. They have to provide individuals with their notice of privacy practices, which essentially describes the types of use and disclosures covered entities can make and describes individuals' rights and covered entities' duties about those, about PHI. And business associates are not required to have their own one, although sometimes they're contractually obligated in their business associate agreements to draft or send out the notice of privacy practices on behalf of their covered entity. So the, the HIPAA rules make a few changes. Um, 
uh, as, as to what needs to be in the Notice of Privacy Practices. We're going to go through a couple of the key ones. Um, the important part is that these are all, according to the government, material changes and therefore require redistribution of the notice. So the notices have to now specifically discuss certain purposes that require authorization that Lisa talked about earlier. Um, for example, the sale of PHI and marketing and um, in certain cases psychotherapy notes. They also have to mention if a covered entity engages in fundraising, they have to say that they're going to engage in fundraising and say that individuals have the right to opt out. Um, as Lisa talked about, there's now covered entities if if they're providers only, this only applies to providers, but if an individual pays out of pocket in full for a particular healthcare service, covered entities have to agree to restrict disclosures about that if, if asked to do so, and that has to be set forth in the Notice of Privacy Practices. And the notice also has to tell individuals that if there's a breach of their PHI that they will be notified. Um, as Kelly talked about, it doesn't have to say how that's going to happen, just has to say that you'll be notified. And for health plans that underwrite, the notice must include a statement that the health plan is prohibited from using or disclosing genetic information for underwriting purposes. And um, just a brief couple minutes on training. HIPAA requires that workforce members with access to PHI be trained on HIPAA security and privacy policies and procedures. Given that these changes are going to require changes to those documents, it's really important to train all current staff who's going to, who are going to be affected within a reasonable period of time after those changes become effective, and if, all, if at all possible by the compliance deadline of September 23rd. Covered entities are not, not necessarily required to train their business associates, but some covered entities, depending on their relationship with the business associate, might want to take that into consideration. And not all training must be formal. It's best practices to provide formal training once a year and then update it as needed. And then with all training, it's important for, um, to keep track of what you trained on, who was there, um, you know, when the training occurred, et cetera, so when the government comes and does an audit, you have those records available. So I'm going to turn it over to Tora to wrap this up. And on training, if only, and this is really Lisa, so I'm stealing from her, if only the hospital out in California had properly trained their nurses, then they wouldn't have been fired when Kim Kardashian gave birth to her baby and they went snooping. They would have known they could not snoop. Um, but thank you for hanging with us. We covered a lot of territory. We tried to give you an overview of HIPAA as it has currently been in effect and then highlight really all the new changes that are coming down the pike in September. As Jen said, the real cornerstone for folks is to do that security analysis to see where they have electronic PHI and is it secure. It's updating your written policies and procedures to make sure you take into account all of these new, new requirements. You update the notices that go, uh, the notices meaning the notice of privacy practices and the forms that go along with it, uh, that you negotiate your business associate agreements. Even if you have the one-year delay, the business associates are subject to all the new rules, so even if you haven't documented it, you want to make sure they're in compliance. And then the new notice of breach standard, you want to incorporate that into your daily practice. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thank you, Tora. Uh, we do have uh, several questions that were posed during the course of the webinar from our webinar participants. I'll start posing those, and if any of you here in the, uh, in the room have questions, just raise your hand and Kelly will come around with the microphone. Um, could you, and uh, just any of you, whoever you think is uh, most uh, relevant to answer the question, just jump in. Could you address rules specific to HIV diagnosis, including testing, case management, and HOPWA? Well, I think really the rules are no different. It's very sensitive information, but, but HIPAA looks at anything, all medical information, as very sensitive. Um, it does harken back to Lisa's discussion about um, restrictions of telling your health plan something. There is that ability when an individual pays in full out of pocket to um, limit the possibility of any further disclosure. But overall, the privacy rule applies in full, the security rule applies in full. Um, really regardless of the source or the type of that information. And then uh, HIPAA is only a floor, so you will see that many states have additional protections for that type of information. And so not only do you have to comply with HIPAA, you need to comply with those heightened requirements under the applicable state law. 
Thank you. Uh, another question. Florida drivers uh, have an option of being an organ donor, and it's noted on the license. Of course, many other states have that as well. Would capturing the driver's license information be considered personally identifiable information? It would be if it were in the hands of a covered entity, but it is not in the hands of a covered entity. Okay. Another question. Please define aggregate information and the permitted use of this information in emails. Um, I think we're talking about um, sort of information that sort of summarizes um, either from a plan perspective or a covered entity perspective um, what's been going on, what the protected health information may have been. It's a, it's, a, it's a summary of that information that has been essentially de-identified, stripped of any form of personal identifier and really couldn't be reconstructed to figure out who those folks are or where that information came from specifically. At that point, when the information has become de-identified, it is no longer considered protected health information and not subject to HIPAA's protections for protected health information. I think the key here is that de-identification is a very high standard. Um, it's not just I blacked out somebody's social security number and their first name. It really has to be that no one looking at that information would be able to, to back out who it is. So while um, aggregate health information can be used, it's not subject to HIPAA's protections, um, that's a very high standard to meet. Thank you. Uh, another question, uh, going back to the beginning of the presentation, what's the difference between a privacy officer and a security officer? That's a really good question. You can make them one and the same person. The security officer is dealing with a security rule, and so you often find that that's an IT person, the head of IT. The privacy is more focused on the compliance with use and disclosure. When can you use somebody's PHI for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations? And you often find that in the compliance department or a legal, chief legal officer. But there's nothing to say that you can't combine the two roles. Okay. Uh, would a, uh, and I'm going to uh, use some different verbiage, but uh, the verbiage we're familiar with is a supporting organization, uh, an organization that's uh, affiliated with typically a 501c3 organization uh, and is uh, designed to raise funds and support the activities of that 501c3 organization. Uh, would a supporting organization to a public university with a medical college be considered a business associate? So I suspect this question is coming up in the fundraising situation, and I'd have to have the regs right in front of me, but I, I, my recollection is that they are drafted in such a way that information can be shared with the foundation for fundraising purposes, and I don't believe you need a business associate agreement, but I would have to double check that. Okay. I know uh, our colleague who's not here on the podium, Pete Parvis, has done a lot of work with our client, the Association for Healthcare Philanthropy in that area. Um, and I believe that is it for our questions from the webcast. Any other questions here in the room? Well, with that, I want to thank our uh, speakers for a, a uh, terrific presentation today, a lot of information. I also want to commend to you, there's uh, several uh, very comprehensive articles, uh, one in particular uh, in the, the handout materials. Those of you in the room have it at your, uh, in front of you. Those of you in the webinar will get it emailed to you tomorrow. Uh, there's a lot of information in, that, uh, in those articles, including one that we did uh, last month authored by almost everyone here on the uh, on the podium uh, that contains a lot of the detail about what you uh, heard here today. Uh, we hope to see you back here uh, maybe later this month and or next month for our upcoming programs. Thanks for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Bye.